Um, so my name is Brian Gimnelli. Uh If you don't know who I am, I uh, founded Motorsport Reg uh, about nine years ago. Uh, today we're used by the majority of the SCCA. And <clears throat> this last year we helped about 320 different organizations manage just over 2,100 events and take 125,000 registrations. So we, uh, in addition to that work, uh, I also serve on the board for San Francisco region as well as uh, on the board for Thunder Hill Raceway. So I've got a I'm kind of lucky to have a wide insight into the different kinds of things that uh, we in this room are doing. <clears throat> what we're going to talk about today is uh, how to rule the web, or at least get started. It's not going to be just social media, but it'll be sort of how social media ties into your overall online presence, and some very specific, concrete things <clears throat> excuse me, that you can do to uh, either get started or to move your ball a little bit further down the field. Uh, the only thing you need to do right now, if you want to write, is just take down my email address. I'm going to make all this stuff available online afterwards, so you don't have to worry about scribbling down uh, URLs or anything like that. Uh, we'll have a slide deck, all the good stuff. We're lucky to make a long video, but uh, at least slides. So uh, just to sit back, relax, listen, uh, think about how this stuff applies to your region. I want to thank uh, Marianne Schultz, who uh, traded a bunch of notes with me. She's from Finger Lakes region. They won the uh, Communications Award last year. Um, and she, are you doing your thesis on social media? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so she's doing her thesis on social media, uh, a good resource to track down. She's right here in the front uh, the weekend, if you're here. And uh, we'll both answer some questions here at the end. I'd like to hold questions towards the end, and then we'll do them in one big batch if we can, uh, just to make sure I can get through all the material. <coughs> so, You've got what I call internally facing challenges and externally facing challenges. You've got the need to run your organization internally, but you also need to do messaging and so forth to the outside world. You're going to need some uh, strategies and tools for both to handle what, you know, in the, in the restaurant world, they'll call the front of the house and the back of the house. You can't really have one without the other, so we need to make sure that we are taking care of both of them. So who here is on the, the club or the region's marketing team? You sure? Okay. I'd say that everyone in this room is on the marketing team if you care about your organization continuing to exist. You know, I mean, for sure the people at this convention are the marketers of the organization because we're taking time away from work, family, friends, racing maybe, uh, to be here this weekend and talk about how to do things better, so on and so forth. So I really think that everyone here is on the marketing team. So that, that sort of begs the question, why do we care about uh, online media and so forth? Well. It's interesting uh, if, if you know that most of the car clubs out there, the established car clubs, despite sort of an unprecedented level of interest in motorsports and cars and so forth, most of the car clubs are not growing. Now, if you were in the annual meeting yesterday, you saw that our numbers here in the SCCA are down another 3,000 members or whatever the number was uh, in the last year. So we have to look at the internet as the disruptor that it can be, the spoiler. There are many organizations on the internet that are doing fantastic. You know, if you think about how retail sales were pre-Amazon.com and post-Amazon.com, it's a classic example of what the internet can enable an upstart to come in and really change the game for all the established players. Well, the same thing is true in the motorsports world. If you look at a site like Renlist.com, which is a Porsche-oriented mailing list, uh, in December of 11, they had 9.7 million impressions on their site, which is mostly forums, uh, 305,000 unique users. There's an event called Bimmerfest in, uh, in California, Pasadena, and it's 10,000 BMW owners who get together for basically a big car show. They have to move it to the Rose Bowl because the event is so big. So there's really no lack of interest. It's more about how are we capturing the interest and, and converting it to something that we can take advantage of. The club of yesterday is definitely not the club of tomorrow, and so neither is the strategy. And that's kind of what we're talking about here and over the course of the convention is what we do to, to capture and make the most of that. You know, if, if you're not already, and there's some regions who are, in the next five years, your newsletters will all be digital. You may have a printed version for some folks, but we already see there's already a handful of regions who have abandoned the printed version to be just digital. It's faster to market, it's cheaper, it's a richer experience. There's nothing wrong with dead trees. I mean, I like to have it in my hands as well, but the primary medium in the future is not going to be that mechanism. We see a lot of times that the editorial people get a little, a little nervous when we start talking about going digital, as though you know, the printed piece of paper is what really defines their job. But that's not the case. It's really all about the content. 
The editorial people will be just as important, if not more important, because now we've got multiple channels and multiple mediums through which to distribute the information. So copywriting, uh, synthesizing the experience for the members, distilling that down, that stuff all becomes more important, not less important. The problem is that uh, online media is definitely not a silver bullet. Uh, it won't make your boring events better. It won't make your club better looking. All it can do is let you be, continue to be authentic, but through a channel and a context that people are, is more desirable for. So who, who here is a, a 10 year member? Okay, keep your hand up if you're 20. About 30. All right, anyone 35? 40? 45? All right, 40. Three 40s, I think? That's awesome. So why, why are you still members after all these years? Passion for the sport. Uh, I, don't, I don't hunt fish or uh, uh, go bowling three nights a week. All right, what else? Passion for the sport? My question is fast cars. Fast cars? Part of the family. So I would say the, the, my, the main reason that people stick around for the long haul is the people. I mean, you can go racing, especially today, in a variety of venues, but the people are sort of the thing that keeps you coming back. So <clears throat> if our clubs are much more than just a list of, of features and discounts or the ability to get on track, you know, we need to be able to communicate that camaraderie uh, and the lasting value. And I think the way to do that is to get some boots on, on the virtual ground. So. We need everybody in this room, since we are the marketers of the club, uh, we need you doing the highest value work. We need you interacting, engaging, and exciting the members. You've only got X hours of volunteer labor, where X is never going to be enough. Uh, even if you're lucky enough, like some of the regions have some full-time office staff, uh, even that's not enough. You know, there's always something else you could be doing. So we're going to need to find a way to get more done with the resources that we already have. This is really why I built Motorsport Reg in the first place. When I volunteered for a BMW CCA driving school program, they were doing everything by hand with spreadsheets and paper checks and manual data entry and so forth. And that's not just inefficient, it's also a drag. Now, there's not really anybody on that team that was like, yes, I get to do the data entry. <laughs> so to the extent that we can find ways to eliminate uh, those more routine tasks, uh, that's definitely going to be uh, good for, for your team. So how do we uh, establish that personal relationship? Well, the first thing is, it comes back to marketing. And the good news is that marketing is actually pretty easy. You need to offer something that doesn't suck, and you need to make sure that people can find it or that they know about it. The bad news is that more than ever, people have lots of choice as to where to spend their time and money. And that's not just between SCCA and NASA, but that's between motor racing or volunteering or any of those things and a million other things, fishing, hunting, bowling. Uh, taking the kids on a road trip during the summer. There's a lot of places where you can spend your time and money that compete with what we want them to do. So if we want it, we need to be able to deliver a quality product so that we can compete for that time. So ask what's in it for them. Always put the member first. You've got to craft everything you're doing, the, the product, the messaging, etc., in terms of what's in it for the member. That should drive both the tone and the content of your messaging. It will also drive the channel. And that's one of the reasons why social media is relevant here. One at a time. So with a uh, rare exception, <coughs> very few of us, there might be a couple, very few of us were in the room when the SCCA was founded. And ideally, none of us will be here when we see the club die. So we need to focus on building processes that can be defined, delegated, and can survive as the volunteers of the organization come and go, and as their interests and time availability changes with time. So we're going to focus on the 20% that gets you the biggest 80% of the bank. You know, limit the amount of stuff you're trying to do, maximize the stuff you get in return. It's still a lot of work, but uh, we'll figure out some ways to make, it, to make it doable. There's a quote that I like. It's, volunteers don't get paid not because they are worthless, but because they are priceless. I, I bet that most people would raise their hand and say they agree with that quote. I hope so, because you know, otherwise we're all sort of doomed. Uh, so my thing is, I think we should be investing in automation, obviously, at Run Motors for Wrench, um, but also eliminating the low value tasks so that, again, you can be focusing on the high value tasks. Instead of jockeying that spreadsheet, what if the person was out walking around the paddock asking if anybody has an issue they need resolved? I mean, there's always something better 
that your limited number of hours could be trying to accomplish out there. So I'm going to say uh, invest 20 bucks a month rather than spend 10 hours a month. That's the philosophy I want people to think about. And finally, you're going to need to experiment and keep learning. Your goal is to keep up the momentum and the excitement for the club in between events or between membership renewals. So we want you to start simple and improve, uh, and you'll learn what works specifically for your organization, your channels, so on and so forth. And before we try to build a skyscraper, we want to make sure that everybody has some running water in the house. Who here sends, who here sends every email for their region using an at domain.com email address, an at region.com email address. Okay, so a third maybe. So if you're not sending every email using at club.com, you're missing out on a free branding opportunity. You know, instead of coming from gmail.com or hotmail.com or something like that, you're missing out on a free opportunity to look more professional, more organized, and let every time that your email gets forwarded somewhere, someone will be like, hey, what is this something 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 scca.com? So if you don't yet have the capability of doing that, and even if you do, I'd strongly recommend going and getting a Google Apps account. It's free uh, for up to 10 users. It gives you all kinds of great stuff like email, you can get Google Groups, uh, there's Google Analytics, which we'll talk about, calendaring, docs, all this stuff. It's shared, it's online, everybody can access it in one place, it's very secure, and it costs you effectively nothing, which from a close perspective is pretty awesome. At a minimum, I'd suggest that you use Google Calendar and their online docs because it's a great place to centralize all of the data for you know, all of your documents and things like that. So that if someone has a hard drive crash or something like that, your, your docs and all of that stuff doesn't get uh, lost forever. All right, that out of the way. So marketing your organization is a lot like working out. Because you know it's good for you, but you put it off to your own detriment. You know, even if you here, personally, are very good at marketing and online media and all this kind of stuff, how good is your organization? What happens when you go on vacation for a month? You know, will the train keep rolling along? So we don't want to let the organization succeed or fail on the back of a single volunteer. It's really important to spread that work around. And you might think, ah, we don't have enough people to spread it around. You, know, you said, I'm the only person on the team, right? Well, we'll talk about some ways to make it easier to spread that stuff around. The main thing is you want to develop this culture of creating and curating. So you're going to need to generate some of your own original content. There's no way around that. But you can also drive a lot of value for your members by curating existing stuff out there. If you think about your own personal Facebook account, you see a cool video and you share it to your friends as well, right? I mean, you're just passing along something that already exists, but your friends see value in that piece of content. So by curating, by resharing what other people have already created, you can add content to your own activity that, that your members will find value or entertainment or other things in. So the first thing I'd recommend, the first action item, is to build an editorial calendar. Does anybody have an editorial calendar outside of their newsletter? The answer is going to be no. Yeah. So a calendar does not have to be complex. This one looks like a calendar, uh, but it could be even just a basic to-do list that can be stored in Google Docs. And this particular one shows uh, you know, Facebook and uh, Twitter and, and blog posts on certain days and so forth, it's unlikely that without full-time staff you'll have that level of activity. But what this calendar can do for you as a team is build consensus about when and where and what you are publishing. When I talk about publishing, it's as simple as a Facebook post, it might be as involved as a blog post, it could be an email newsletter, it could be any of those things. But, you know, we've all got events, right, and we need to do marketing for those events. Well, ideally, your marketing should happen at sort of predetermined intervals ahead of that event. You know, 90 days out, 60 days out, 30 days out, so on and so forth. Two days before saying, please, please, please. Uh, and if you have a calendar, this is the first step towards defining something that can be shared among other people. Now, if in your head is the only place where you know what the marketing plan is, there's no way that you can get help with that. On the other hand, if you had a very simple but laid out plan for when and where we're going to post content, you can say, hey, I know that you're good on Facebook. Why don't you help me out with an hour a month and post when these calendars, uh, when this calendar says you should post? So this is not so much a club thing as an organization thing. Simply putting a little bit of time into making a list makes it a lot easier for you to both visualize as well as share the workload of doing some of these things. 
So if you don't have anything today, and we don't, uh, I'd start off with a Google list. Um, I actually have one that uh, I've posted. This URL will be in the downloadable stuff. Uh, but it's a template on Google Spreadsheet that you can use. And it's really a glorified to-do list with some dates. It's a good place to start. All right, let's talk about your home base. So we've got a home base and we've got outposts. You know, if you think about the internet as the universe, then your website is the center of your galaxy. It's ultimately the only website that you own, because everywhere else you're just a tenant. You know, Facebook, you don't own the land, they're just renting it to you. So obviously it's one of the most important things that you've got, uh, and you want to make sure that you take care of it. Who here updates the website uh, monthly? Okay, weekly? Uh, daily? Or let's say two or three times a week? Uh, cool. uh, who here has a website that can be exclusively updated via a web browser? They don't need any technical or HTML kind of monkey around. Alright, good. So, you know, most of your work in email and social media is around driving awareness of your organization and driving traffic back to your website. So that means the website doesn't need to be good in the sense like it needs to be fancily designed, but it definitely needs to be easily updated so that it stays active and relevant. So don't have a static website. There's tons of tools, off-the-shelf software, like WordPress, Joomla, or Drupal, all the links are in here in a little bit, that can allow you to edit the website 100% with no code. You use your web browser, you put a user and a password in, and you can edit 100% of the content. And if you want that website to do some fancy stuff, like show an event calendar, or read in on an RSS feed, or any of this other stuff, there's plugins that do all those things, and again, no code is necessary. So there's a little bit of work to get the design to look the way you want, but that's a whole lot better than building a website from scratch. And in today's world, with the, with the quality of the software out there, there's no reason to build from scratch. You know, our entire business is predicated on software development, but for our corporate site and blog, we use WordPress. I mean, it's really, really good, and it would be really, really expensive to build something anywhere near as good. If you can find a host that will handle the updates for you, uh, that's also a nice thing. That means that they'll make sure that the software's kept up to date, you don't have to worry about staying secure and so forth. Uh, WordPress is a software.org. There's also WordPress.com, which is a uh, commercial entity attached to it, and they manage the platform for you, so you just pay, I think it's like 10 bucks a year, and, uh, and you get, they'll, they'll host your website. There's some limitations on their particular version. You can't update everything the way you might want, but for 10 bucks a year, it's not a bad place to start. So I'll show you a couple of examples and some things that I want you to think about with your website. This is the St. Louis site, obviously. Uh, what I like about this is that they've got, um, it, it looks fresh, it's regularly updated. I also like that they've got a little bit of content tailored to people who don't know what they're looking at. Uh, you know, when you're thinking about what's in it for me, we all know all the lingo and the slang that goes along with what we do. But people who don't know anything about us, those people that we want to join and, and come out and play, they don't know all the terminology. You know, autocross is a great term, but what does autocross really look like? It looks like racing in a parking lot. So I know that some of the insurance people like to shy away from using the word racing, but when we're trying to explain these things to average folks, the majority of the population who are not SEC members, we need to think about the terminology, the language that they're going to use, not only when they're discussing it with us, but when they're looking in the search engine for it. You know, if you search, I don't know, if you search Google for it, Cones in a parking lot, I don't know what you find, but you probably wouldn't find autocross first. So we need to think about how we, we talk on a website as that impacts the findability in search engines like Google. Alright, so poof, you have a, a website, is anybody using it? Who has Google Analytics or something similar? Alright, Google Analytics, Google Analytics is free. It takes about three seconds to copy in a couple lines of code. It's going to give you all kinds of really interesting graphs and usage statistics on your website. What's more interesting than just how many people are hitting it is when it comes to things like email and social media, how effective are those campaigns? So this particular graph is actually showing the number of clicks from an email campaign. And so you can see, all right, on the first day there was kind of a little spike in activity and then there was nothing for a couple days and then a few more and then it kind of dribbled out there. What's interesting about this specific graph 
is it's taking advantage of a new feature on Motorsport Reg, where you can now put your Google Analytics uh, ID into Motorsport Reg, and you'll be able to see traffic on our website in your Google Analytics dashboard. So any pages that relate to your events on Motorsport Reg, you'll be able to see how many people are clicking through and accessing the pages in your Google Analytics. Normally you can't see activity from other websites. But this is going to give you one cohesive picture as to how effective are the links you're posting on Facebook, how effective are your email campaigns, what happens when you change a little bit of copy, do you get more click-throughs? Because it turns out a very small change in copy, like subject lines or um, links, things like that, it can have a significant impact in how many people will click through on something. But if you don't have a way of measuring, you certainly don't have a way of knowing. And that's what this will give you. When it comes to talking about people and, and what they, they don't know, you know, don't know what you don't know, I, thought, I think what SCCA did on their homepage uh, is actually really, really clever, and it's a good solution to this. You know, if you haven't been to the SCCA site recently, you get a pop-up window the first time you hit the site that says, new here, here's a bunch of stuff you can do with your car, here's kind of an introduction to what we do, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you click the uh, close window and they cookie you so that it remembers and it doesn't show you to it again for 90 days or 120 days, something like that. I think that's a really uh, clever way to differentiate the needs of people who don't know what they're looking for and those who do. Who did update the website? What's that? Who, did, who was the one that did update it? Question is who did the updated website? Uh, it's a company called racersites.com. Uh, they're in Southern California. Charlotte. Charlotte? All right, they're in Charlotte. The, the other Southern California. Is, are any of them in Southern California? I don't know. Uh, they might be I could have sworn the guy had a Santa Barbara number made it up. Okay. So uh, these web action items, all the action items I'm going to show you, they're all in the downloadable stuff. So again, don't worry about scribbling them down. The one thing I did specifically mention though is item number two, which is about search engine optimization. Uh, for San Francisco region's website, we have the .com and the .org. And until about 12 months ago, you could access those sites via www.sfrscca.org, .com, and you can also get it with just no www in front. Well, in the eyes of the search engine, what you effectively have are four different websites. And Google, in particular, calculates the value of your website or the importance of your website based upon how many people are linking to you. So if people are linking to effectively four different websites, you're getting 25% of the ranking when you have the site available via all those means. So there's a very simple uh, technique, it's called canonicalizing the URL, and basically what that means is that it redirects one to the other. And if you've got, uh, whoever sets up the website or manages the website, they should be able to handle that for you, but definitely check to make sure that your site is not accessible through all those. Today, if you get sfrscca.com, it will redirect you to www.sfrcca.org. And that's really important. Otherwise, uh, some of the work that you're going to put into in, in, in relevance and being found in the search engine uh, is just going to be thrown uh, out the window. Who here sends email that looks, has pretty, pretty templates like this? That's a small number of people. All right, how many people, uh, maybe you're not the one sending the email, are you receiving email from your region that looks very nice like that? There's been more hands. Okay. So here's the thing. Who wants to receive nice looking email and who wants to receive, you know, kind of ugly email? <laughs> now, I personally prefer text email. But the statistics do not lie that HTML formatted email is way, way more effective. We measure effectiveness in terms of how many people click through, how many people open, et cetera, et cetera. So there's no reason, the good news is that there's no reason not to be using these pretty templates. What is it? Get nothing. Okay, so you think you get you don't get it under mobile? Yeah, I mean you, you, you get very little. Okay, so uh, there's a company called Mailchimp.com. <laughs> Anybody use Mailchimp? All right, a few hands. Good, good. So Mailchimp, besides all the other awesomeness that they give you, uh, they'll let you send 12,000 emails per month for free. Very few regions are going to send more email than that per month, which means your entire email activity should be free. The other thing they give you, though, are a couple hundred different email templates, free of charge also. And not only can you use them in MailChimp, but you can also paste them into Motorsport Reg Email Blaster as well. The value of these templates is that they're tested on all the different email clients, they're tested on all the different web email clients, and most of them are optimized for mobile as well. 
So the, the idea that you have to choose between reading on the mobile and not reading on the mobile, not necessarily. If you build your templates correctly, they should be accessible on all those devices. So I, I definitely recommend checking out MailChimp, whether you want to use them or not, but also take a look at their templates. You know, they'll give you a huge list of them. There's also a company called Campaign Monitor that does the same thing. Um, the one nice thing about MailChimp is that uh, some of the guys that work at MailChimp, they are autocrossers in the Atlanta region. So, um, you know, they're kind of family. They're like, you know, a distant primate relative. <laughs> All right, for inbound email, who uses something other than their own inbox or Gmail or whatever the case is to answer email? Does anybody have a tool? Zero. All right, who here has answered the same question about 10,000 times? That's the life of an event organizer. Do I need a helmet? Do I need a license? Do I have to be a member? Yada, yada, yada. So San Francisco region, we recently uh, switched to using something called User Voice. And User Voice is a web-based ticketing system, but more based around email, that lets you have all of your email come into a centralized tool, and then one or more people can reply to it. What makes User Voice better than using your inbox is that as you type in a question into this uh, search feedback and help desk box here, it automatically starts suggesting responses from your knowledge base. The knowledge base is just stuff that you put in there. So as you answer questions, you add that to the knowledge base, the next time someone asks that question, the suggestion is automatically given to them what the answer is. Now, if the answer can't be automatically answered, then on the back end, there's a web-based interface that allows one or more people to share the workload of answering those questions. And there are templates. So when someone asks, do I need to be a member? You can reply with a very well thought out piece of content that talks about, here's the kind of memberships that are an option, here's what you do to get those memberships, et cetera, et cetera. If you're worried about them being too boilerplate, you can edit them as they go out so they don't have to be exactly carbon copy. The one that we use at uh, Motorsport Reg to do this is called Email Center Pro. It's a similar concept. Uh, it doesn't have the end user auto answering piece, but it has a really nice sort of outlook looking interface for answering email. And so Anne and I, we both use this. Uh, whoever gets in there first answers the email. Uh, we can see actually when someone's editing uh, or when someone's answering an email. It gives you some reporting, uh, templates again to auto answer the most commonly asked questions. Really, really useful. So user voice, I think we pay $5 a month for. Email center pro is about $20 a month. But again, we're talking about how can you save time to spend time doing something higher value there's nothing lower value than answering the same question than for the 50th time. So, you know, five to twenty dollars a month, not only will it let you share that workload with potentially some other people, but also do it at a faster clip. All right, email action items, this is in the uh, downloads tab as well. My right button is very happy. All right, so we've talked about the home base. Let's talk about the outposts, the reason why you're here at home. So if, for those of you new to social media or digital marketing, most of the services we're going to talk about are designed to be used from a wide variety of devices. That means text message on a regular phone, smartphones, tablets, web browsers, etc., etc. We're even seeing support for some of these apps now on smart TVs. So there's some Samsungs and some Sonys now that have Facebook basically baked into the TV itself. The current crop of smartphones, uh, you know, they've got dual core processors, uh, HD video, eight megapixel cameras. I mean, they're as powerful as my laptop. So the ability for people to consume and publish really rich content from anywhere is, is here today. You know, maybe you don't have that phone yet, but a lot of people do. I'll give you a quick example of the, the power, of, <laughs> power of social media, which is not the power of this little remote control. Uh, so I'm really excited about the Formula One race that's coming, and I made my hotel reservation the day they announced the dates, and then I made them again when they announced the revised dates. So I have two rooms at the Red Roof Inn, it's about two miles from the track, uh, and my rate is $99 a night. Because when I made my reservation, news sort of hadn't trickled through yet about when those dates were going to be. Well, lo and behold, about a month after I make that reservation, I get a phone call that says, oh, well, we have this unsighted uh, event policy for special events, and you know, yada, 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 we have to cancel one of your rooms. I'm sure it's related entirely to this policy and not trying to charge $400 a night you know, to the next guy that signs up. 
So I went online and I tweeted to the parent company, which in this case is Hilton. Hilton tweets back to me, sets up a three-way phone call with me and the uh, hotel manager. And miraculously, that policy no longer applies and I get my second room back at $99 a night. So think about this without Twitter and so on and so forth. My really only avenue of, of recourse would have been to spend a lot of time on a phone with a hotel manager who is definitely incentivized not to help me. But instead, in about 30 minutes, I had this whole thing satisfied to, to, to my satisfaction. I mean, that's incredible. And I'm, I'm stoked. So think about this. Am I more likely to still be loyal to Hilton? I may not like that particular hotel. Luckily, I don't go to Austin all that often. But, but Hilton, Hilton has earned some loyalty. And not only did they earn loyalty from me, but I also went online and retweeted and said, thank you. Thank you, Hilton, for helping me out. So there's public acknowledgement of the good work that they did on my behalf. That's pretty awesome. And that kind of story is not really that uncommon. You know, this market as conversation theory was popularized in a book called The Clue Train Manifesto, maybe eight or nine years ago. And the whole concept is that this is not a broadcast medium. These are interactive. You know, they say interactive all the time, but it really is a two-way. It's a conversation, not a broadcast. And we need to think about that in terms of our, our social media approach. The one warning that I would have is that a lot of people say social media is free because no one actually charges you to post on Facebook and so forth. But unless your time is not worth anything, uh, there definitely is a cost to it. So that's one of the reasons that we want to have a plan so that we're not just wasting our time, which is really, really valuable. So before we get too chatty, I want you to think about one thing. Once you find that you have an audience, you may find some disagreement about how you should be using it. You know, what is okay to say online? What's not okay to say online? Uh, can I delete posts or comments? Can I promote my favorite vendors or my buddies? You know, these people are supposed to be using your channels. Your, your volunteers should be representing the region. So I would recommend that you have a social media policy that outlines what is and isn't okay. And I wrote a simple one-page one for San Francisco region uh, last year, which I'm also making available as a download. It's mostly common sense, but we have a few things in there about what we think is okay and what's not okay. And this makes it, again, easier to bring new people onto the team and help, help distribute the workload by having everyone on the same page about what they should and shouldn't be doing. The good news is that most of it's common sense, but uh, you know, not everyone has the same thing about common sense. So the entire social media landscape uh, is represented in a lot of infographics from time to time. This is one of them. Uh, it's complex, it's evolving, it's huge. The good news is that us in this room, we care about a very, very small percentage of that. Uh, even if you were a Fortune 500 company, it would be pretty hard pressed to be successful in a, in a large percentage of those, those channels. So what we're going to do is prioritize. We're going to focus on the 20% that gives us the 80% return. And that's going to be Facebook, Twitter, Flickr, and YouTube. <coughs> now, personally, who likes Vimeo over YouTube? So Vimeo, in my opinion, has a much better interface. It's nicer to use. I think they have higher upload limits. They support HD video a little bit better and so forth. But, but Vimeo has a teeny tiny portion of the traffic that YouTube has. So from an organizational perspective, Vimeo is useless, even if it's better. I think uh, Vimeo had 8 million users in December of 11. YouTube had 140 million. I think YouTube is actually the third largest search engine on the web. I mean, it's just for me. So remember that it's not about you, it's about them. What's in it for them? You, know, you want to be where the users are looking for your content. Now you might ask, if we have all these different services, how are we ever going to find anything? The answer is uh, using tags. And tags are just arbitrary keywords that you get to make up. Racing, it might be your region abbreviation, uh, it could be formula car, spec me on, it could be whatever it might be. But it's just an arbitrary keyword that you pick that describes your content. And these keywords get indexed by search engines, which makes it easy to find content from one of those channels to the next channel to the next channel. So search engines index Flickr and YouTube, and your website, and so on and so forth. If you use a consistent set of tags from one site to the next, then it makes it easy for not only you, but your members and fans to find your related content on those services as well. 
We're seeing things, if, the, if you see with the pound symbol in front like this, that's something that's Twitter specific, but it's really just a way of differentiating the word racing, the, the, the topic racing, from racing the verb. It's still the same concept. It's an arbitrary topic name that someone's picked that describes something about the content. You can tag basically anything. It can be text, photo, video, etc. And in this sample here from San Francisco region, this is one of our uh, a picture from Turn 1 at, at Infineon. Um, these are some potential tags that we could use for this photo. Now, if we trained everybody who took a photo at our event to use the tag SFRSCCA, then with a search on Flickr, you'd be able to dig up all of these images that pertain to the region. But if you don't set the tag yourself, then what you're going to wind up with are people using SFR, SCCA, SFR, SCCA with a space, SFR, SCCA without a space, et cetera, et cetera, San Francisco region maybe. You're going to have all these variants that make it very challenging for any one person to find all the content. So it's your responsibility as the organizer, as the club, et cetera, to, to set the tags and lead by example. People aren't going to be perfect. You know, it's like herding cats. But at least if you set up your own set of tags and use them prolifically, then your members will catch on. The reason why they'll catch on is because they're already sharing their content. They're already uploading their videos to YouTube. They're already posting their pictures on Flickr and Facebook and so forth. They want to share. They want those things to be discovered. So what you're doing is giving them a tool that helps it get beyond their immediate circle of friends and hopefully exposed to other people that want to see it as well. All right, so Facebook is definitely the 800-pound uh, gorilla. And it's going to be your number one priority for social media. Who here has a Facebook fan page in the region? Much it's good. So at the, a few weeks ago, I was in Texas uh, at the South Dev meeting. And uh, I, I'm not going to name names here, but they were sitting around talking about how we ought, to, we ought to get online to get more racers. You know, what can we do online to get more racers? And someone says, can we make a Facebook page? And there had been a little bit of earlier discussion, but someone said, we have one. The young people have taken care of it. And the guy responds and says, well, where is it? And, and the person said, it's on Facebook. So the lesson here is that simply having a Facebook page is not good enough. It needs to be integrated into your overall communication strategy. And that's not complicated. That just means when you send an email, let people know you have a Facebook page. On your Facebook page, periodically tell people about your emails. On your website, have a link to all of those things. And you make sure that those channels are in the right place at the right time. You may be familiar with the, with the F icon as a little badge. Well, if you're not hot to trot on social media, that F might not mean anything to you. So sometimes you might want to be a little bit more explanatory about what the value of this whole thing is. I just talked to someone this morning who's like, eh, you know, Facebook to me is half annoying and half useful. Well, all right, that person then might not see the reason why they would be interested in being a fan of the Facebook page. So sometimes explain, not just assume that everyone has the same, the same understanding. <coughs> so we have our uh, region website, or region Facebook page, and there's a couple of interesting, uh, a couple of interesting numbers. So 85% of all internet users, not Americans, not people who spend a lot of time online, not young people, 85% of all internet users have a Facebook account. And that's a pretty staggering statistic. 57% of all internet users have 100 or more friends on Facebook. I mean, I have a hard time believing that's true, but it's just, it's just amazing. So, the strength, obviously, for Facebook is the ability for people to share with their friends and stay in touch. So where you might be creating mostly content, original content on your own website, you should feel free to curate on your Facebook and other social media channels to stay active, interesting, and relevant to your members without necessarily creating everything yourself. This example that's here on the screen is a little small, but you know the Hans device, or, or a head and neck restraint device, is now a requirement for club racing. Uh, although we've told people 55 times, we know that they're going to show up at the first event without one and wonder what's going on. So one of the things we posted here this last week was a, a video that had been making the rounds on Facebook of this really horrific uh, car crash. And attached to that we said, don't forget, you need to have Hans device or head and neck restraint. So it doesn't necessarily always have to be, uh, you know, registrations open, we're having our event at such and such a date. You can have all these other opportunities 
to touch base with your members and potential members in a way that's interesting, fun, share something kind of cool, and even still maybe attach your message to it. So that curating is a really powerful way for you to stay active on Facebook uh, and these other channels without having to do everything yourself. It's critical because a, a net, having a dead presence is worse than not having one at all. I mean, in San Francisco region, we had one several years ago, and the guy who had been in charge of it, he sort of fell off the page, and the page went dead. And, you know, when you go to Facebook and the page is, is not updated, it shows nothing, which is like, you know, a house with broken windows. Is there anybody home? Do they really care about what's going on here? We definitely don't want to look like we don't care. One thing you can see up here at the top is that we've got uh, five different admins for our Facebook page. Uh, really easy for everyone to post one or two things per week, and that means we get at least one or two per day. If you've got lots of time and maybe money, uh, you can customize your Facebook fan page like crazy. Red Bull has both of those, so they also have 27 million fans. Um, Facebook actually just announced the, a couple days ago that the timeline approach that we see on our personal pages, that's coming to fan pages as well. So fan pages, the Red Bull one has actually changed since I took this screenshot last week. It now has one really big image across the top, uh, and then it's got kind of the timeline approach at the bottom. So if you don't yet know about that, you should take a look because your page will change automatically on March 31st. <coughs> All right, a few things to do for Facebook. And those are in the, the downloads as well. You already have the page, not a big deal. How many people have the like box on their own website? All right, you all have Facebook fan pages, so get the like box on your own site. The reason to add the like box to your site is when someone clicks like for a piece of content, and it could be like announcing that an event is open for registration or something along those lines, that gets fed back into their activity stream, which effectively shows up to some people based upon Facebook's crazy algorithms. So you're giving people one more opportunity to sort of implicitly share with their friends what they're up to or what they're interested in. All right, Twitter. If you're not familiar with Twitter, it's a micro content service where every post is restricted to 140 characters. That's because originally the site was really only used via text messaging, and that's the length of a text message. Updates today can be sent from anywhere, web, smartphone, SMS, uh, tablet, etc. you name it. And it's, it's kind of the fact that they've got a proliferation of third-party apps for every platform that's made Twitter the juggernaut that it is. I think uh, as of last year, they had 100 million active users per month and 800 million search queries per day. I mean, again, just a monster amount of, of, of users and activity. We're probably familiar with some of the stories where Twitter is the source of news for things like the uprisings in, in the Middle East. Uh, oftentimes these guys are way ahead of what the mainstream media can get. So people look to it for sort of breaking stories, uh, fast moving content, you know, interesting stuff that's really easy to share. Uh, and you might say, well, why do we care about being relevant in a 140 character landscape? It's because not only are some of your members there today, but there's probably a whole lot of potential future members there today. Now, we're not interested in only messaging to the people who are already are members. Right? I mean, the club brings in, what do they say, 9,000 members a year and loses 9,100. So we need to be finding people and engaging them in the context of their choice as a way of keeping them around. There's a few examples up here that I like. Um, people use it for all kinds of different stuff. You'll see uh, event announcements, you know, content announcements. Uh, Oregon region does a cool thing, or they did last year, where they post sort of play-by-play -play, uh, race activity, so that if you're not at the track, you can keep an eye on who's doing what. So you know, it's not it's updated about four or five times during the race, kind of gives some of the key the key changes. I think that's pretty cool. What's nice about Twitter is that it's definitely informal and casual. So you can use it as a, as a drip marketing program. You know, you don't have to worry about, in 140 characters, you can only craft so much cleverness. So the nice thing about it is that you can do a little bit more of an informal conversation between your members uh, and people who might be paying attention. You can ask questions, you can respond to other people's posts. It's a good way to stay engaged. The key with all this, like we said at the beginning, is that this is an interactive thing. So don't be all me, 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 me. You know, if we're supposed to be having a conversation, 
and all you want to do is talk about yourself, it's pretty boring. So you definitely need to do some talking, but you want to do some listening and also do some replying. Super easy to get started. Uh, one thing I didn't mention, but on all these platforms, try to pick one consistent uh, abbreviation for your region. You know, we use SFR SCCA. You guys all have the same thing. To the extent possible, always get the same thing on all the platforms, as it'll be easier for people to follow you. It will also be your quote unquote official um, official presence. So we talked about how the long-term members stick around partly because of the people, partly because of the cars. And if that's the case, then why don't we show those things? A picture's worth a thousand words. We already know that nobody reads on the internet, so you know, what you write is only going to be half, half skimmed over. But a picture, a picture's pretty engaging. So show the fun that people are having. I mean, that's why we keep going to these events, right? Remind existing members why, hey, maybe you haven't been out for a little while, but here's the fun that you're missing out on. If you set up a Flickr group for your organization, you can let anyone join and submit photos. You can also use um, the, the tags, like for your organization or for the thing that it is, to help group them together. And you can help people get the photos that they're already sharing to promote them and share them with other people. When we needed photos for our awards banquet, uh, we had to scrounge up a couple hundred photos. Like it took some work to get a slideshow of a couple hundred photos from our members, as opposed to all photos from just one guy. DC region, they've got uh, what they call 18 region photographers. And I don't really think it's an official thing, but it's more that these people know to take photos and then tag them on Flickr in a certain way. And when they sent out a call for photos, uh, they told me that they came back with 30,000 photos. Now, that's a separate problem. <laughs> I can even find which photos you actually want to use. But I'll tell you, it's far better to choose from 30,000 than it is to choose from 200, where half of those are also crap. So, go to Flickr. Uh, it's owned by Yahoo. If you have a Yahoo account, you can set it up. Again, set up all of these accounts in the name of the organization so that they don't get locked into one guy or a girl who you know, decides to no longer participate and, and falls off the planet. Uh, it is kind of important that you get permission to use their photos. Uh, the photos that I'm using in this presentation, for example, are all Creative Commons licensed. The nice thing about Flickr is it makes it very easy for people to flag their photos as usable for non-commercial purposes. So, you, know, you have to be a little bit careful about just going in and stealing people's photos. So I mentioned that YouTube is like the, the internet's third largest search engine. It's also a huge traffic driver for a lot of people. But it's just like Flickr except video. You know, if seeing a photo is great of, a, of an event and having fun, then seeing video is even better. It's also more time consuming, more engaging, you can hear, uh, it gets more of the senses engaged. The tests show that video is far more likely to be clicked on than text. So it's a very powerful component to your Facebook posts, to your Twitter posts, to any other channel. <coughs> I can vouch for people who are in the 20-something bracket because my brother-in-law can spend hours just surfing from one three-minute video to the next. You know, he's not really interested in watching an hour-long TV show. He'd much rather sit there and watch one video, one video, one video. So there's no reason that your organization can't be in that queue of one video, one video, one video. I just uh, spoke last week at the BMWCCA convention that they had, and I did a quick survey before I went, and I found only three of their 75 chapters, or whatever the number is, only three of them had a YouTube channel. And one of them didn't even have BMWCCA in the name. It's the same as BMW Club. That's their sort of historical name. But it didn't say BMWCCA anywhere. So think about this. If you want people to find you, you know, the secret car club of America, as we like to joke, I mean, let's make it really hard. Let's not have any keywords, no descriptions, no names, no nothing. And Windy City, they actually had a lot of really cool videos from their Street Survival program, but there was no descriptions. I mean, unless someone sent you directly to the link, there's no way to find that video. Uh, YouTube, like Flickr, you can curate. San Francisco region set up a YouTube channel. We have not uploaded a single video all we've done is curated and created playlists of videos that already exist on YouTube. So you don't have to do it all yourself. Again, you can just collect what's out there and relevant to your members and make it available to them. Once you've created a YouTube channel, uh, you can pipe it to other places like your own website. 
uh, San Francisco embeds it into our Facebook page, which is pretty cool. You know, the, the home and outpost model we talked about is not exactly a, a hub with spokes, but it's kind of like a star where some of the content can be piped from one format to another. Um, so Facebook to YouTube, YouTube to Facebook, so on and so forth. So some ways to get started with YouTube. YouTube is a little bit unique that you can only have one administrator. So more than any of the other services, this one's super important that you set it up with an organizer account. Uh, again, tied hopefully to an activate.com email address, which means you'll never lose control over it. All right, so we talked that there's you know, no shortage of work to be done. The question is, how do, you, how do you make it happen? How do you get it done? Well, I think you should get some tools to help automate these processes. So we talked about spending 20 bucks a month as opposed to 10 hours a month. This is the only way that you're going to be able to scale your organization to the scale that it needs to have. If the volunteers really are priceless, then maybe it's worth charging $1 extra per event so that you have the budget, if you don't have the budget today, to make some of these things happen. You know, it's not just about breaking even on a per event basis, but how do you break even on a success basis? And that's a longer term thinking. So two things I'm going to recommend that you try out are uh, social media dashboards. It's probably the best, the best bang for the buck. There's two of them in particular that are a good place to start. One's called Hootsuite, and the other is Sprout Social. And basically what these tools do is give you one interface to administer multiple social networks. So from one consolidated interface, you can see Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn and anywhere else that your uh, region may be. What they also let you do is schedule posts. They let you follow anybody else who's talking about you. They give you some CRM tools and some analytics. There's all kinds of benefits that you get. Hootsuite has a free and a $6 a month plan. Uh, Sprout Social is like $9 a month, so uh, they're very affordable. I think they offer some nonprofit pricing as well, um, but a great place to start. You know, if you think about the ability to schedule the posts in advance, um, you should be able to sit down at the beginning of the season, and we talked about having an editorial calendar. You should be able to sit down with that editorial calendar, and you could pre-schedule your email campaigns, your tweets, and your Facebook posts, all in one fell swoop. You know, it's oftentimes hard to find like an hour here and an hour there. But sometimes it's easier to sit down and find four hours on one day, and you can do the whole thing in one fell swoop. And you can have your entire marketing campaign for an event or some other promotion all set up, ready to go. It'll just happen automatically. The one piece of advice I'm going to give you is that as you start listening, you may hear the faint sound of people whining. I mean, no one would ever complain on the internet, right? That's just, that would never happen. So the thing is, though, is this is an opportunity. And we go back to those retention numbers. We get 9,000, we lose 9,100. I mean, if you have the opportunity to intervene with a potentially dissatisfied member and rectify whatever the problem is, assuming it's correctable, then you're just like me with my Austin Hotel story. I'm no longer unhappy. In fact, I'm more loyal than ever. So these social media dashboards in particular are going to give you the ability to listen across, across a wide variety of platforms and catch this unhappiness as it's happening. Some people can't be satisfied, so you need to pick your balance too. All right, so let's wrap up. So we're going to summarize on, on how to go to market. You're going to put together a plan, you're going to budget accordingly, and then you're going to execute. Simple, right? Some of the specific tactics are here, and all this stuff is in the, uh, in the download. But the goal is to take the minimum amount of effort and maximize the visibility and the reach. Do that by recycling content. Not only your own content that you're creating, which means take a blog post, make a Twitter post out of it, post it to Facebook, etc., but also curate what other people and your members and so forth are already sharing. If you publish a new blog post, you know, post it on Facebook and, and so forth. Make sure that you have enough administrators so that no one person either saves or kills the region. And you don't ever want to lose control of your account. You know, if the person who has the only control of your Facebook fan page decides they no longer like the region, and they kick you out and start posting mean things about you, Facebook, there's no recourse. Like, Facebook won't get in the middle of that, as far as I'm aware. So the only way to fix that is up front. 
set it up the right way. You can fix it now, but do it before it's too late. <coughs> and then make sure you're tagging all of your links in your emails and social media so that when you use Google Analytics, you can see how those are performing. And once you see how things are performing, you'll be able to make improvements. So that's what I have. Any questions? So the question is, I said uh, you should use a consistent set of tags. How do you set them up? You set them up by using them, leading by example. But in most cases, it's not something you configure. It's just something you use. And that's one of the problems is that tags are an ad hoc taxonomy. That's a fancy way of just saying there's no controls. It's not configured in advance. So the only way you can really enforce it is by using it yourself and letting people know if they're using them incorrectly. Hey, if you use this, you'll get more visibility too. The main way that you set your tags, though, is by leading by example. So, for example, uh, SCCA Official is the Twitter account for SCCA, and they've been tagging all of their Twitter posts with pound sign SCCA convention. And so, as a, as a response, you know, that we naturally sort of do it and follow along as well. I just, um, I just wanted to say, too, that for our events, um, you set up, for especially for Twitter, set up your hashtags before the event and determine what it's going to be. You can put it on your, especially for club racing, you can put it right on your um, entry form or put it on your, if you know, work through Brian's company, you can put it on that. Um, also make sure you put it, you know, advance it on your Facebook page and your other social media. And people will know that because your competitors and your workers are going to be, you know, if we have smartphones, they're going to be the ones who can be your, your citizen journalists and let everybody know what's going on. So let me ask, answer the first, the second part first. So the question is partly about email frequency or, or contact frequency. Um, what I've seen that works well is about three times per month, no more than that. Because you're right, too much email is worse than not than no email whatsoever. People unsubscribe. Three times a month about the same subject. I three times a month, period. Ooh. And this is going to require some coordination around your your <laughs> member or among the club, right? Now here's the thing: if you've got something very event specific. Like if you're using MSR, for example, and you need to send something about, hey, next week you're going to show up in terms of procedure, an email blast to those people, those 100 people, those 120 people, that's okay. But what you want to be very careful of are club-wide communication, especially email. What I've seen successful is around three times per month. And that's challenging. So the reason why an editorial calendar will help is that this will help you batch up. Oh, here's what we need to communicate. I need to get this into this email blast. Okay, it's one more line item in that email. To go back to your first part of the question about do you want documents in more places or in one place, you definitely need one central source. I recommend the Google Apps approach more as an internal tool there, but if you don't have a place on your website, it's also a perfectly acceptable external tool as well. The one nice thing that the Google Apps does give you is um, their documents and spreadsheets and so forth, um, most of them are versioned. So not only can you see what it was today, but you can also go back in time and see previous versions of the document. Uh, that's kind of a nice feature. So, I mean, generally speaking, you know, we don't have a lot of time and money and so forth, so if we can get someone else to shoulder the burden of continually updating that application, hosting documents for us, you know, between website refreshes that we might do ourselves, I think that's a useful thing. If you've got it on your website, that's great, though. One central place. Though. Yeah, one central place. And that's great for everybody because, you know, you've got your subs, you've got all that stuff, right? If that can live in one place, it's just a whole lot easier for everybody to know, here it is, go get it there. So frequency is definitely a key part, and I can tell you, so on the Motorsport Reg side, we get to see every time an email is flagged as spam. So when you send an email through us and someone says junk in Hotmail or Gmail or those things, they have what's called a feedback loop, and we see that. And I'll tell you, the number one thing that drives unsubscribes is when you send an email out and you immediately send one 10 minutes later saying, oops, uh, I forgot, or here's the link, or something, something, something. So, you know, the frequency is the issue. One time they might forgive you, the second time they're like, eh, the third time they're like, ah, this is too much, and they unsubscribe. And, and there is a frequency that's appropriate for each of these channels. You know, Twitter, you can go all day long. Uh, Facebook, you know, several times per day is good, but, but within reason. Email, obviously, less frequently, like we're talking three-ish times a month. On the web, because the web is a pull as opposed to push, you can go as often as you want because people will come and get it as, as necessary. But, you definitely want to maintain a contract, if you will, with your folks. 
You know, the SEC official one was always posting 50 things per day, then it wouldn't be a surprise when you got 50 things per day when the national's on. But it's not good to change your frequency 